What I like about science is how there's so much to learn and how you can interact in so many different ways. I think science is interesting because you can look around and learn things that you never knew about everything you see. My favorite part of science is learning new things. The experiments that we do at school. You can learn all different things and when you learn one thing, there's also multiple things you have to learn about that. I first started off as the wetlands and waterfowl biologist for the department in this area. Basically my job was to study wetlands, wetlands restoration, uh, do waterfowl research and, and monitoring and population surveys. And then after 14 years experience there, I moved up to the, my current position. Right now I am trying to get together the resources to do more marsh restoration work in different areas of our project and maintaining the other areas in their current condition and are improving where I can. Academically, I'm a biologist with a couple degrees in engineering. I was hired as an engineer, but the, oh, 20, 30 years ago, there weren't very many biologists and oil companies. So I, uh, although hired as an engineer, they used me mostly as a biologist. One day I went into a boss and pitched a project to build a treatment wetland. Uh, it happened to be in Kansas. My boss told me it wouldn't work. And I was crazy. My response was, you're half right. A couple years later, I had the wetland built and it was functional. Ever since then, I've been building and restoring wetlands all over the world. I probably like learning different things that isn't basic knowledge. My favorite part of science is learning new concepts. The thing I like about science most is just learning about everything. What I like most about science is getting to learn all the different things and seeing all that we've discovered throughout the years. I am the water quality control manager for the City of Beaumont's Water Utilities Department. I monitor the water quality from the drinking water that you receive to the wastewater that gets discharged. So I kind of monitor all of that. Not from Beaumont, so I came to Beaumont uh, to go to Lamar University and I started working in the wastewater lab as a college student. My background is in science. I got a environmental science degree from Lamar University, bachelor's degree, and moved my way up through the city in my profession and I consider myself an environmentalist, uh, protecting the community, protecting the environment, uh, you know, public health in general. And I have a great passion for my job. I love my job, I don't do it for the money, I do it for the, for the work that I do, and not many people can say that. The most enjoyable part of my work is actually coming out to these projects and seeing the success, the, the use by the ducks and the fish and all the other wildlife after we spent years trying to get it to come together. I'm a kid who grew up in the Midwest. Uh, my dad and my grandfather taught me to farm. I'm second generation off the farm. So when I look at these wetlands, to me it's just strictly a version of farming. Uh, when I was doing all my farming kind of stuff and all the family farms are now subdivisions, uh, the only thing I ever planted, I ate. I started doing wetland type work. I started planting things I didn't eat. It was very strange to start off doing things like that. So I have a rule that I have to be able to out hike my interns. And so that keeps me uh, exercising year round. I never want a 20 something intern to out hike me when I go into the field. That's been my challenge. And so far I've been able to do that. And some year one of them is gonna catch me. Uh, I think the most interesting part is you will be able to know what you contribute. You know, when you know that the water is good, the quality is good, you know that you do something good to the environment. When you see the kids get involved to the, this environment over here, and they start to get interested and they wanted to help more with the environment, I think that's really good. So my best part for this job is you can see you make a difference. The best part of my job is uh, when I do presentations with the kids, you know, to see their faces. You know, actually, <laughs> the parents, I think they get more excited than the kids, you know, over the years, I, I noticed that. You know, at first it was about the kids, and, and I think the parents enjoy it more than the kids. I just enjoy being able to get my message out because there's a lot of misconceptions out there about the American alligator. The science, the science part of it, it's ever changing. Um, there's always something new coming along and, and that, that keeps your interest. And the other part is also uh, educating the public. I like getting out and talking about what I do. Um, it's, and 
It's just an interesting job. I like science because it's different than all the other subjects. It's more about animals and like basic stuff that you use in life. The thing I like most about science is how it can create things, it can uh, create more ways to, to use things, it can pretty much uh, alter a way that you can think about something, how you can grow plants, that's agricultural science. There's uh, mechanical objects that work, like cameras for, uh, for like mechanical science. There's, I like the diversity of science. I like just seeing everything, meeting all the different creatures. Yeah. What I like the most about science is the animals. What I like most about science is uh, learning new things and you can like experiment with stuff. It's really fun to experiment instead of just like writing down things. You actually get to experiment with it, play with it. I like that we can get more technical into what's going on around us. It draws my attention because I like to know exactly what it is that we're learning about and what it is that's going on around us. Even though I like science and I would love to be a scientist or a marine biologist, I want to be an artist. I would like to be a doctor when I grow up. A biologist. I want to be a zoologist. A engineering science, like studying cars. Uh, like physics or life science. Uh, when I grow up, I would like to be either an author, an editor, or a biologist. I would like to be a marine biologist when I grow up so I could be able to study all the tiny marine life that we have on Earth. Start with your science courses. Don't forget math. Math is important in every, every career job that you take. It might not be as detailed as, as doing accounting all the way up to engineering, but math is important. So starting in the sciences early. The environmental field will always be here. Um, we, it's something that we need to protect. It's, it's where we live. So um, start with the sciences, very important. In order to be a, a biologist, you have to go to school and get a degree in wildlife. Or, or you have to specialize in uh, botany or genetics. It has to be a, a specific field that we're looking for. And if you can get an advanced degree in it, that's even better. If you do get in, it's, it's a wonderful job to have. It's, it's a great position. Think outside the box, which I've been accused of of never thinking inside the box. So I beg, borrow, and steal from any scientific discipline uh, as a kid, I was good at math. Uh, I didn't like chemistry, but I ended up with multiple degrees in chemical engineering. And that kind of happened uh, due to food science and uh, other things that suddenly I found applications that made sense. And then I, as a kid, I liked to fish. And the more I learned about water chemistry, the more fish I caught. So that's kind of the way I got into it. So I tell you, uh, learn your chemistry, learn your biology. The rest of the stuff will work out if you want to work in wetlands. Uh, of course, the other maths, sciences, chemistry, physics, all of those other courses. Heavy on the wildlife, wildlife management, uh, ornithology, mammalogy, courses like that. They're going to learn a lot in the classroom. But it isn't going to be effective until they come out here and they experience it firsthand and actually spend some time uh, just up front with the uh, environment and the wildlife that they live in. We're close to the coast. Uh, this southeast Texas is kind of a transition area from the big thicket, the forested area that you have down to the coastal plains to the different types of wetland systems. You have the marsh wetlands and then you have the inland wetland systems. So it's, it's a huge variety. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have a lot of industry in this area, but yet we still have a lot of environmental open out, you know, natural areas still. Um, it's a good place to be. I made this my home. I don't think I'll ever leave it. This area has, it's one of the most abundant places to see wildlife in the wild. I mean, if you can name it, you can probably see it here. You have alligators, possums, skunks, coon, beaver, otter. I mean, just, a, just an abundance of wildlife. Don't focus too much on one particular topic, the, but don't be too much of a generalist. Make the best use of your, your student research. Exercise your investigative skills, your data analysis skills, and always be curious about what's going on around you. Don't just assume that you know what's going on. Uh, get your nose in the, in the dirt and get it good.
The Jason Alliance of Southeast Texas dedicates this wonderful wetlands video to Dr. Michael Hoke, founding director of Shangri-La Botanical Gardens and Nature Center, founding director of the Big Thickets Association's Natchez River Adventures, president of the Golden Triangle Sierra Club, an active supporter of the Beaumont Children's Museum. Michael was kind to our earth and an award-winning Southeast Texas science educator for children of all ages for more than four decades. Welcome to Lamar University and this year's Jason event, Wonderful Wetlands. Hi, I'm Jaden Stack from Little Cypress Junior High and your Argo co-host. Hi, I'm Willie Reynolds from West Orange Stark Middle School and your other co-host. First, we are going to visit Sea Rim State Park to find out what wetlands are and why they are so important. Next, we will visit a salt marsh near Bridge City, Texas to see how scientists and engineers restored it from being highly stressed into healthy and productive marsh. Then, we will visit Beaumont's man-made cattail marsh to see how the marsh helps clean Beaumont's wastewater. Finally, we will go to J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area to visit the apex predator in Texas wetlands. So, so let's, let's head, head to, to the, the coast. coast. Stop, our student art goes around the coast at Sea Rim State Park near Sabine Pass, Texas. Their expert guide is Texas Parks and Wildlife's ranger, Kathy Smith, who has led them into the middle of a coastal marsh using the Gambusia Boardwalk Trail, where they can explore the marsh while keeping their feet dry and out of the home of the park's alligators. Kathy is explaining what makes wetlands wonderful and their importance in providing habitats needed for baby fishes and other coastal species to grow up in. This area here that you see around you is a coastal wetland. It is a uh, freshwater and saltwater mix. This is a transition zone between land and water. Many, many animals begin their life either at the marsh or they eat things that do grow in the marsh. What a wetland does, the reason that a wetland is so important to us here is because they act as a filter they act as a nursery for all the aquatic species in the, or many of the aquatic species in the Gulf of Mexico, and also they're important for waterfowl. 70% of the birds that use the central fly, flyway, they stop here. They stop here in Texas coastal marshes to overwinter. They leave the northern marshes up in Canada and even up in the Arctic and fly all the way down here to spend the winter. Some of the birds, like the whooping crane, Texas coastal westlands are their only wintering ground. So it's very important for several endangered species and other, and other animals. One of the things that a coastal wetland or a coastal marsh is known for is its grass community. They have to be specially adapted to the changing salinity or salt level in the water. And they also have to be adapted to the different water levels. We have, these are tidal marshes. They're affected by the tides. Sometimes they're very low. There's hardly any water in them. And sometimes they're pretty full of water like they are now. There's very few plants that can adapt to those you know, erratic changes in their environment. And that's why you don't see as many species here as you do in a forest or in a, in a swamp. One of the biggest threats to, this, to the marshlands is, of course, channelization where they, uh, years ago, they would drain the marshes, they put in channels, they put in ditches and drains the marshes, and any time you do that, you change that whole ecosystem. Uh, we've also had some pretty powerful hurricanes come through here in the past few years, and we've lost marsh and wetlands that way. Why does it affect the wetlands when a hurricane comes? What it does is when you have the storm surge and you have all that salt water coming in from the Gulf and these plants have adapted to live in a certain salinity level and it changes that. It brings a lot more salt water in. 
Plus, at the same time, it's also being washed by all that rain. When the, when the storm surge goes subsides, then you have all that fresh water coming in. And one of the things that the fresh water brings in is invasive species. So it changes things up, and it takes nature a little while to adjust to that. How long does it take a wetland to return back to its natural way after a tragedy? This area right here was hit, hit pretty hard by the hurricanes, and you can see it looks pretty good right now. You know, so it just depends on how high that storm uh, surge went, how far into the marsh it went, and what the um, you know the duration of the storm, how much damage the hurricanes are doing, and they seem to be becoming more frequent now with changing climate. But uh, wetlands also, they act as a buffer zone. If you can imagine a storm surge coming through here, all these high grasses, they're going to slow that water down before they ever get to populated areas. That's another function of the, the coastal marshes, is to protect the inland areas from, from that storm surge and that salt. Where we live right here on the Texas Gulf Coast, southeast Texas, we got the Mississippi coming into the ocean and it has a lot of pollutants in there, okay? So we have fish in this area here and they're catfish, they're considered a trash fish, but without them, our ocean would be so polluted you wouldn't be able to walk in the water, let alone think about catching fish because they dwell off the bottom, they eat off the bottom and they take care of all of that poison and toxins that's out there. Okay? There's all types of species of fish out there that do that as well. How large of an effect would it be on our ecosystem if we lost a piece of our marshlands? Going on the ecosystem, if we lose one part of the marshlands, we're going to lose a part of our fisheries. Another reason why that we do everything we can to protect our marshes. How many different species of fish breed in one area? You're looking at the whole Texas Gulf Coast. You're looking uh, from Texas clean on up to Florida. We've got everything from uh, sharks to uh, big bull reds to speckled trout to, to black drum to, to croaker. So there's a ver wide variety, but the important thing is, is they wouldn't be there if it wasn't for our marshes. Uh, in our marshes uh, is where these are bred. So they actually live in the marshes till they're old enough, and then they migrate into the ocean. When it comes breeding time, a lot of them come right back to the same area. So when we lose a part of our wetland, we lose generations of fish. Okay. Another thing that they like about the wetland is that's where our shrimp and all come from. This is why we protect it. Okay. It's a sanctuary for them. So as long as we keep that wildlife alive and healthy, we will always have a healthy ocean in this area. The best experience for me today was walking through the marshlands, learning about how the animals and the environment adapt and how it's precious to them. I learned about how marshlands are very important in our environment, how we should take care of them. There's so much to learn and how you can interact in so many different ways. Helping clean up pollution, anything that affects the environment. What I've learned today that has changed my behavior is how we have affected the marshes and everything and how we could save it and how important they are to our ecosystem. The thing I've learned about the marshlands today is that they are becoming fewer and that we need to help protect them. I would like to be a marine biologist when I grow up so I could be able to study all the tiny marine life that we have on Earth. You can learn all different things and when you learn one thing there's also multiple things you have to learn about that. The best experience for me today was crabbing. Definitely crabbing. It was fun. I learned that marshes can actually filter pollution to stop it from going into the ocean. Some species of animals are extremely sensitive to change, so I'll be more careful when I'm throwing stuff away and make sure it doesn't pollute the environment. It draws my attention because I like to know exactly what it is that we're learning about and what it is that's going on around us. Today, getting to see the marshlands up close and learning what really goes on in them, I will make sure to not pollute the earth and make sure to impact that no one else pollutes earth either. Years ago, people thought that wetlands were stinky, nasty, bug-riddled places that you needed to fill in. And many wetlands have been filled in for shopping malls and, and roads and buildings. Some of it has been through the channelization. Some of it's also been uh, through subsidence. 
and subsidences when we, we, we pull fresh water out of the ground for uh, human water needs or we pull oil out, that leaves a void and it sinks. Well, when the, when the land sinks, it's no longer a marsh. It becomes a bay or it becomes a deep water area where these marsh crashes, it's way too deep for them to live. Then we realize that that is where all these juvenile fish come from and how important they are to the migrating species. And so people started to think, you know, maybe we shouldn't be filling in these wetlands. Maybe we need to manage them a little better. They are very important for the ecosystem, for our uh, fisheries, for wildlife, for migrating birds as a buffer zone from uh, storm surge and as a filter for uh, biological pollutants and chemical pollutants. One reason Texas coastal marshes are so important is that they are A, habitats for polar bears, B, nurseries for baby fishes and crabs, C, good places to fill in to build shopping malls. The correct answer is B, nurseries for baby fishes and crabs. at Texas Parks and Wildlife's Lower Natchez Wildlife Management Area near Bridge City, Texas. Here, marsh restoration experts, Jim Myers from Chevron and Michael Rizutek from Texas Parks and Wildlife's J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area are going to show us the results of their efforts to restore the marsh, much of which had reverted to unproductive open water. About 10 years ago, a team of scientists and engineers began to restore the marsh to its former healthy state and high productivity. So, any questions? Why did you rebuild the swamp? I mean, marsh. <laughs> Two points. There's a difference between a swamp and a marsh. Marsh is dominated by vegetated herbaceous plants. The swamp is dominated by trees. Uh, the second question, why did we restore it? Simple answer is because it was falling apart. Over the decades since oil and development started in this area, the roads, the canals that were dug, were letting a lot of salt water from Sabine Lake make their way deeper into the marsh than they had been. This marsh was not built on saline waters and saline soils. It was a more of a freshwater marsh. So when it was exposed to that salt water, it started to die off. And when it died off, the roots broke apart, the organic soils washed away, and we lost elevation. So the only way we could bring it back was to bring in inorganic materials and bring that elevation back up. Now the reason we do that is twofold. For parks and wildlife, it's a matter of wildlife habitat. Vast expanses of open water are not nearly as productive as marsh like you see here, where you've got water interspersed with vegetation. The second thing is these marshes help protect against storm surges. When you've got plants that are growing tall, as the waters, the waves start to come across, these plants offer friction against those waves and slow them down. And it may not seem possible, but with enough marsh, it can actually knock off a couple of feet of the storm surge and make the difference between being overtopped or not at a storm levee. For us, though, it was more wildlife habitat. The ducks needed a place, the fish needed a place, birds, herons, uh, alligators, nutria, Everything that was living in the marsh out here before it fell apart had started to move out. And for us, that was a problem. So we endeavored, we had the opportunity to partner with Chevron to bring it back this marsh, and, and we did just that. How long did it take to rebuild the marsh? Uh, it was about a year before, from the very first time they started putting things in till the, they finished with all the planting, about right? Yeah, we moved about 200,000 cubic yards of soil to rebuild the elevation on the marsh. So it'd be the right elevation for the plants. And that was dr dredge spoils, fresh dredge spoils out of the canals. We also had old, old dredge spoils that were mounted up high, kind of liquefied those and slurried them, pumped them out, and set up a series of things to get it back to the right height. So what we did basically was replace the lost organic soils with mineral soils to bring that elevation back up. Now the plants can start growing again. And they're growing so well and so thick, I mean, you, if you try to walk through here, it's going to be an exercise, that they're starting to build their own organic soils again. So maybe by the time I retire, I'll, we'll have maybe a half inch to three quarters of an inch of a layer of organic soils here. And I don't plan on retiring for another 20 years or so. It's, a, it's that slow of a process. But sea level rise around here is 
no faster on average than the rate of accumulation of the organic materials. So what we think we've done, and we're, we're pretty confident that we have succeeded, at, at least in that part, is created a marsh that can actually keep up with sea level rise and maintain itself so that we don't have to come in here every few years and put more material on here. It's going to start sustaining itself. And that's really the goal of any kind of a restoration project. We don't do it and then come back and have to add more to it in five years because that, that's really not a successful project. The other facet on this is we have lots of specialists who are called upon to work on this. We had engineers, we had geolog geologists, biologists, botanists, zoologists, ichthyologists, hydrologists. Everybody contributed. Nobody was smart enough to get it all right and a lot of us disagreed on some of the things but eventually we put it together and made it work and so this is a little different approach the tendency if you have one person makes all the decisions you usually make a couple of wrong ones but if you got a good group together you'll catch the things no no don't do that for this reason so we adjusted and adapted things on this and all of us at least my participation I learned a lot of things from a lot of people on this project how do fire affect the marsh all the plants you see out here are adapted to fire it's a part of their life cycle and so it's not going to harm the plants. The, you've got the water and the muck acts as an insulating layer. So the engineering, the thermodynamics on it is such that the heat, about 99% of it goes up into the air. Only a little bit goes into the soil. So you never kill a marsh with a fire. It always regrows quite nicely. It's a good thing if the marsh has gotten so choked with dead material that new growth is not coming up. Then the fire would clear away the old dead material and give the, the new growth a chance to sprout. The flip side of that is if you take off the dead material, you take off all the material that you're using to build your organic soils. So you've got the nice green, healthy looking plants. That's the primary productivity. That's the live standing biomass. And then you've got this one. It's a little yellowish, kind of browning out down here. But then you've got this nice dark brown looking material down here. This is dead material that has been here for couple of years and this is the material that as it settles down into the water will start forming the organic soils again. And this is what your organic soil would actually look like? Yes. This, this here would be a good example of organic soil. It looks like just a bunch of muck with some dead plant material in it and that's all it really is but it supports plants and that's what the organic soils look, that were in here before looked like. What is the climax in the succession of a marsh? If you look, you can see like those little islands of grass way out by the power lines. That's what this marsh looks like when it's falling apart. You get these bigger islands and they just keep shrinking and shrinking and eventually they just fall away and there's nothing left and you're left with this big expanse of open water. Open water is good, but just like everything else in moderation, you don't want too much. And this is getting to be on the side of too much because you're losing your primary productivity. This is the sign of a marsh in decline. So we're, we're constantly trying to, if not stop it, reverse it. But again, it, it's a balancing act between hydrology, elevation, and, and plants. So Now, when I say restoration, I, I need to make, make sure you understand that I'm not talking about what used to be here 30 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago, because the conditions that that marsh existed in are no longer here. The, the soil salinities are different, the water salinities are different, the tidal exchange is different, but I can build a marsh so that it functions as a marsh. So yes, we still have the functions. We got the fish habitat, the, the duck habitat, the habitat for the invertebrates, and plant species that can live well in here, do their primary production, and start building organic soils. Maybe in another 30 or 40 years, we'll see a change in the plant species because things have changed here. If it gets fresher, we'll see different plant species start coming in. Or as we get more organic soil, plants that prefer organic soils will start coming in and plants that prefer mineral soils will start going out. It's all succession based on current conditions, but through that whole succession, it's still functioning as a marsh. The best experience today was walking in the marshes, seeing all the animals, telling me not to litter and mess with the environment. just how important it is to us because it directly affects all of our food. The best experience of today was seeing how the plant life survives in the marsh. 
it shows me how important and fragile this marshland environment is. The best experience today for me has been seeing the wildlife. I've learned that the wetlands is an important and vital piece to our society. I'll treat the environment with more respect. Here's the thing that I hope you guys take home with you, that these coastal marshes aren't wastelands. They're not worthless pieces of property that we should fill in and build on because they serve a lot of functions for society. One, they filter water before it gets to the oceans. Two, they help control floodwaters by, one, soaking it up and releasing it slowly, and two, slowing down storm surges during coastal storms. And three, there's an old saying that says basically, no wetlands, no seafood, because they do serve as the cradle for all the, the commercial and recreational fish and shrimp and, and things like that that everybody likes to go out and catch. You wouldn't have your crabs, your redfish, your sea trout, your shrimp. The economic, the recreational, the water quality, and without them, you wouldn't have your healthy bays, you wouldn't have your healthy gulf fisheries that you do now. So they really are important. They're not just wastelands to be discarded or filled in. Complete the saying, no wetlands, no, A, problem, B, seafood, C, water. The correct answer is B, seafood. I'm Karen Warren. I'm the Water Quality Control Manager for the City of Beaumont. I take care of uh, the water quality issues from your drinking water all the way to your wastewater. Make sure that it's healthy as we treat it and it goes out to the environment and also that it gets cleaned up before it reaches your house. All the sewer pipes come from your house, from the businesses, flow by gravity and it's about 30 feet down and from that low point the pumps pump it up to the top of the hill which you can see outside and it reaches the primary clarifiers. Those primary clarifiers are settling tanks. The wastewater that comes in, uh, all the heavy materials settle down to the bottom. All the light floatable materials are at the top. So we skim the top and then all the heavy solids that are at the bottom of that tank end up in the digesters. That sludge gets treated there as well, gets dewatered and gets taken to the landfill. The water then flows to the trickling filters, which is the next tanks you see there. All right, we are standing in front of the trickling filters. What this is, is it's about four foot of rocks that allows for the biological mass to grow on that actually does the treatment of the wastewater. Right now, we're probably pumping about 20 million gallons of water through these arms. So you can see the underside is tan in color, but the surface where the wastewater comes has biological mass growing on it. There's millions and trillions of bacteria growing on just this one rock. If you want to hold it, you can feel how kind of it's slimy. And that is because the more surface area you have, the more biological mass can grow on those rocks. So the water that you see that's flowing out of those arms has to be constant. Any point where the water stops flowing over an area, the biomass dies off. It has to have constant food. Why are so many birds attracted to the tanks? One of the reasons is because we have biological growth growing. So we also have worms, we have snails, and so the birds will eat and also because the settling tanks are open bodies of water. They actually are feeding on some of the organisms that are growing here. How can you say that the water is being filtered if there's all these different worms and snails in the rock? They actually take the pollutants as a food, and that's what's treating and cleaning the water up. A lot of people think that wastewater treatment has to do with only physical and chemical means, but actually, for centuries, biology is what's treated our wastewater. What happens is those pollutants end up in those organisms, they take it into their body, they do a conversion, so all these organisms are what is actually doing the treatment of the wastewater. So they're very, very important. 
now we're at the final process of the wastewater treatment. So this is the constructed wetlands, and this wetlands is 900 acres. About 650 of that is actual water. By the time it reaches here, it's already cleaned up. The only part that we're still trying to remove or do final polishing on is the ammonia nitrogen. We have to reduce that down to a usable form of nitrates, nitrites, and so this constructed wetlands does that. One of the uh, primary things that we did with the constructed wetlands was to create an environment for the bacteria to operate that actually does the reduction. And the primary plant that we planted was bulrush, and it's actually like a straw. So you can look at it and see that there's holes in the center, and it's actually triangular shaped. And what that does is it pulls oxygen down into the root zone, and the root zone area is an oxygenated area because the bacteria that does the conversion of ammonia has to have oxygen. And one of the things that we did find out when we built this constructed wetlands is that you have to have a diversity of plants. Do you ever have to harvest the grass here? That's a good question. Actually, um, a lot of the design that w went into the wetlands was so that you would not have to harvest. Just like with your yard, you have to mow and you have to maintain. So over time, you could get one species of plant growing more than the other. So we'll have to go through and weed those out and then plant the plants that we want. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at doing is, is doing a, a burn, where you actually burn the marsh grass. Because in nature, lightning strikes and you get a fire and things, you know, it's, it's part of nature. So we're gonna try to be doing that this coming up year. Hopefully that's gonna benefit us. Do you get like a lot of alligators around here? Yes, a lot of alligators. We're right next to the bayou and Hildebrandt Bayou has, at one time when I floated down the river, we counted about 20 alligators in the water. Well, now we built this constructed wetlands and a wetlands is a natural habitat. We also have some deep water zones where alligators like to stay under and uh, we also have alligators throughout the seasons that actually build their nests here. Are we able to fish out here in the marsh? We consider this a natural area uh, just like the sign says no hunting or fishing. We want the the wildlife that comes out here to be in a natural habitat that's not threatened. Any fish that are here feed the birds and feed the alligators um, and the eagles. We do have a, a pair of eagles. However, I have been told that down the bayou past our discharge that the game fish have gotten bigger and healthier because we've cleaned the water up more. So if you want to fish and get a big bass, go downstream of our outfall and you'll find good fish. Essentially what we're doing is we're creating an environment for the biologicals to work, to do treatment. A lot of people think, well, you're filtering the water through a wetlands. There is some filtering going on for solids, but for the most part, the actual reduction of pollutants is bi still biological. The wetlands, for the most part, does a very good job of treating. Uh, the primary thing that we want out here is to make sure that the plants are healthy and that we have a good growth across the wetlands. Where does Cattail Marsh get most of its water? A. The Natchez River. B. From rainfall. C. Beaumont's Wastewater Plant. The correct answer is C. Beaumont's Wastewater Plant. Good afternoon, and welcome to the J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area. My name is Amos Cooper, and I'm a wildlife biologist here on the project. Uh, I am the alligator program leader for the state of Texas. My main job is to make sure that the alligator population is stable, as well as uh, conducting surveys, nesting, and uh, spotlight counts to make sure that we got adequate numbers out there. I've been doing this job now for like 32 years, and uh, Last year I had the highlight of my career and it was doing Black History Month. Uh, if you didn't know, I am the only wildlife black biologist in the state of Texas. I have been the only one for some 30 years now. So that made me feel good. Like I said, that was kind of an apex of, of my career for, uh, so far. But uh, you hear that we're gonna talk about a little bit about the alligator, the American alligator. This is the alligator distribution as it occurs today in the United States. 
primarily all your 13 southern states is, is where alligators occur. Texas has the third largest alligator population in the United States, behind that of Florida and Louisiana. The uh, biology of the American alligator, people ask me all the time about how do they breathe? They breathe through the nostrils on their nose. And when the tape is on their mouth, I have it, it's only on the bony part. It doesn't hurt them at all. The alligator has two eyelids. He has one that works horizontal, and he has one that works up and down. The one that works horizontal is for, he uses it when he goes on the water so he can still see. It's just like a protective film over his eye. His ear is little slits right behind that bone. His little brain sits right there. You can see where the bone stops at, where it separates at. Alligator has 80 teeth, all canine, because they don't chew their food. They just tear off chunks and they swallow it whole. Okay, alligators, what do they eat? Anything they can catch, they're opportunistic. Uh, smaller alligators, just eat, they just eat smaller prey. Of course, your large alligators, boy, they eat each other. I mean, we found out that the biggest alligator out there is what stabilizes that population. Because the alligator is the top predator, and, and they're not as aggressive as people say they are, but they are dangerous. You got to use a respect for them. And, and these, some of these animals on the table, each the alligator, when they're little, and when the alligator gets bigger, it turns around to eat some of these animals. Uh, starting with this animal here, this is what Nutri rat. The second skin is a musk rat. These are both rodents, They're, they both eat vegetation. Okay, this is a cottontail rabbit. And this is a bobcat. Uh, it will eat alligators when they're smaller. And if alligator get larger, it feeds on the bobcat. The number one culprit it's your raccoon for predation on allig baby alligators. Raccoon is number one. Uh, usually when a raccoon finds an alligator nest, it will not stop until every egg is eaten. The next one here is a river otter. Yeah, this is a resident of primarily of southeast Texas. Uh, it's also a fish eater. It will eat baby alligators also. This is a mink. Uh, it's pretty common around here. And this one is a uh, <clears throat> possum. You see these every day, in your, usually in your backyard and garbage can. And uh, the number two culprit for uh, alligator predation is your feral hog. They do a lot of damage to uh, alligator nests. Okay, we talked about the apex predator. Now it's time to, to meet them. We have two of these guys. It's about the same size, so they're about the same age. They're about four years old. They grow about six to eight inches a year until they get four feet. Once they get four feet, they start getting wider, what we call putting on girth, getting fat on you. You guys are welcome. Come up and hold one of these predators. Now, these are American alligators. Now, and, and one thing you always do when you hold him, you make sure you got most of his tail because eventually he's going to move. And if you hold him way down here and that tail moves, it'll slap you and it hurts. <laughs> you know, the tail is always going to be two-thirds of his body. Alligator has a uh, four-chambered heart, so when they go in the water, they can slow their heart rate down to a little bit of nothing. Like I said, they've been documented a big male stay on it for a full day before he has to come up for air. You remember, neck and tail, neck and tail. And, and one thing too, and don't be afraid to hold him, because he's gonna move on you. If you just lay him in your hands and he moves, he's gonna get away from you. There you go. So in a clutch, how do you tell if it's a male or a female? Uh, temp they're temperature dependent. The higher the temperature, the more males you're gonna get. The lower temperature, female. So what we try to do, because males grow faster, when we try to uh, in when we incubate them in, the, in uh, captivity, you put it at 88.7. That gives us 75% males and 25% female. Which one's bigger when they're born, male or female? They're about the same size when they're born, but once you start putting food to them, the male's gonna outgrow them. The females, yeah. And then in the wild, you know, you very seldom see a female get past 10 feet because she uses a lot of her energy in the reproduction side of it versus the male. They just eat and grow, eat and grow. I'm sorry, eat, grow, and fight. <laughs> <laughs> so how fast can they run? They, oh, they're behind the 35. You know, these guys, these small ones are much faster. 
they're quick. Uh, that's what, these are the ones who most people get injured by is your three and four footers because, oh, they're so cute. And before you get your hand to the ground, he done turn and, and hit you. Does the pattern mean anything? It's camouflage. Yeah, it helps protect him. Uh, they, he'll lose this pattern when he gets four feet. He's going to be that one solid dark color. But yeah, while they're small, that's, that helps them hide in the grass and different vegetation from animals. And it's, it's amazing uh, that we have as many as we do because of all the predation that's on these guys. Uh, you, you know, you find them out there with three legs, missing tails all the time. Oh, wow. And in, in a big guy to get a big 10, 11 footer, you might find four or five of these guys in his stomach. Oh, wow. How powerful do you think the draws are? Real powerful. I mean, right now, they, it, it won't take nothing off simply because he's not big enough. Because once they snap, they spin, the weight of their body is what tears stuff off. Because, you know, he ain't, once he let, let, he's not letting it go. He got it all with 80K9. So that's why the little bitty ones, once you, if they grab you, you can grab them and hold them, keep them from spinning. But the big boys, you almost got to wrap yourself up with them and roll. Otherwise, it's coming off. Can they bite through bone? Through bone? It crush bone. It's got like, what, 2,500 pounds of crushing power. It's got three large muscles for crushing and closing. One thin one for opening. That's why you can hold it shut with your hand. Oh, wow. He is the ultimate predator. They live to be about 60 years in captivity on average and about 45 in a while. Oh, it takes them about 10 to 15 years to reach six feet. Once they reach six feet, it's considered an adult alligator. Are they smart? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're not stupid. That's how you, how you think they got <laughs> big. There's some big gators out there. Usually during hunting season, right up until hunting season, you see them guys all over the place. The day of hunting season, they're gone. And you see them the day after hunting season back out moving around again. You see how it, mm -hmm. aerodynamics have it for swimming. You know, when the alligator swim, I hear some guys saying that he was swimming with his leg. Only thing they do with their leg, they balance themselves. The legs hang out like that. They thrust that tail. The tail is all of the action. That's why it's two thirds of their body. That's their propulsion. Just like he laying out, that's why those legs go through the water. He just have them hanging to the side. There you go. He's, he's waking up. He's pretty strong, ain't he? Hopefully. That's what I'm saying. You don't fight him. Just let him let him do his thing. Are there more gators than people in Jefferson County? Uh, I would have to say it was 50-50. Uh, the population estimate for Jefferson County is 100,000. Uh, however, uh, that's a low estimate. Normally, the, the real true population is usually four times that, so it would be about, estimated about 400,000, which would be pretty equal to the population of Jefferson County. What do you do when the alligator makes a nest on your land? Stay away from it. Mark it so people can see it and stay away from it. Uh, you know, and if it's an area that you're going to be frequently going in, you're going to use, then you might want to get it removed. Why are we not supposed to feed alligators? Once you start feeding the alligator, you're looking, making him look at every human as a food source. And that's when somebody is going to get killed. Uh, and, and what people need to understand is once you do that, we got one alternative, and that's to put that animal down because somebody's going to get hurt. Has anyone in Texas ever been eaten by an alligator? Uh, no, we have had a, we just had a death from an alligator in Texas, but you're saying eaten, he wasn't eaten, he was killed. Police say a 28 year old man was killed by a gator in Adams Bayou near Burkett's Marina. What is your favorite part of what you do? This, uh, talking to people, you know, uh, alligators is a different breed, you know, uh, it's, based on perception, and that's my job, is try to help people with those perceptions. I mean, I don't ever want to tell nobody that an alligator is not dangerous, because he is dangerous. But we just got, like I said, use a common sense approach, give him 15, 15 feet. In protection of yourself, you got the right to kill an alligator. But if you do, you got to call the law enforcement immediately, so they can come out and salvage that animal. But most people want to shoot him because they think they can possess it. It, it don't work that way. We, we're going to come out and take that animal and, and salvage it, yeah. In order to be a, a biologist, you have to go to school and get a degree in wildlife. Or, or you have to specialize in uh, botany or genetics. It has to be a, a specific field that we're looking for. Otherwise, in this field, you need a degree in wildlife. 
And if you can get an advanced degree in it, that's even better. If you do get in, it's, it's a wonderful job to have. It's, it's a great position. The number one natural predator of alligators is A, bull sharks, B, bobcats, C, bigger gators. The correct answer is C, bigger gators. Thanks for coming to this year's Jason program. Remember, Jason needs Argos like you for National Jason missions. If you would like to apply to be a National Argo, visit the Jason website, jason.org, for details. And, and be, be sure, sure to come, come back, back next year for Jason's, Jason's next expedition. expedition.